please put your hands together and help me give a warm welcome to our host, Gus Ramsey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, one and all. Thank you for coming out here today. Uh, I would love to spend the next hour talking with Charles about Russell Wilson going to the Broncos. Uh, in deference to other two guests, we're only going to do that for half an hour, and then we'll get into the other stuff. Charles Davis played safety for the University of Tennessee in the 80s and, among many other things, has been an NFL color commentator for Fox and CBS. Many of our students also know him as one of the voices of the Madden NFL video game franchise. No one questions my decision-making more than Charles on a daily basis, including my wife. Uh, here to share his journey from athlete to analyst, please welcome Charles Davis. AJ Przinsky was a career 280 hitter over 19 seasons in the major leagues, a career 290 hitter, 292 hitter in 32 career postseason games. He caught a no-hitter, a perfect game. He won a World Series with the White Sox in 2005 and racked up, or, up to over 2,000 career hits, which is a rare feat for a catcher. He now calls game for Fox. Sharing his path from athlete to analyst, please welcome AJ Przinsky. <laughs> And Byron Saxton was a wrestler in WWE's developmental circuits for five years and is a proud Florida Gator. He has worked on all of WWE's flagship shows, traveled the world, and made his debut as announcer on Monday Night Raw after Brock Lesnar beat the holy hell out of Michael Cole, JBL, and Booker T. Here to tell us about his literal bumps in the road from athlete to analyst is Brian, Byron Saxton. Byron Saxton! Byron Saxton! <laughs> You can tell we got some wrestling fans here. I'll pay you guys later, don't worry. <laughs> Charles, I, I want to begin with you. Your road from athlete to analyst is kind of under the road less traveled category. Yeah. Share with us about how you went from athlete to pro analyst. You're right, it's probably the road less traveled because as a normal deal, AJ, tremendous player, World Series champion, actually did it at the highest level by working as a wrestler. I was a college athlete only, so for me to call NFL games, that's a little bit unusual. And for me to get involved in it, a little bit unusual. And the bottom line is, I just got a call out of the blue from someone because a friend of mine thought that I would make a good college football analyst, never told me, gave my name and information to an executive at uh, Fox Sports South by the name of Steve Craddock, who now works on the NASCAR circuit. And he had my card for two years and got jammed up, <laughs> needed an analyst for a college football game. And eight days before the game, he had run out of people to ask. And in the bottom line, when we agreed for me to do it, I just asked him, I said, how many people did you call ahead of me? He said, 30 to 40. He said, but people just couldn't do it. And I said, well, you're hiring me for two games, and you've never seen me do it. I said, what if I'm really bad in the first game? And he said, well, you'll be really bad in the second game because you're all <laughs> I've got. And that's how it all started for me, and I got involved. And my first game was uh, Memphis State at Mississippi State College Football. And my second game was UCF at South Carolina. And so it began there, and I was fortunate enough to get here. But leading up to that, nothing in television. What, what was no, I, 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 worked, I worked for a living, as I like to call it. I, I was an intern at the Southeastern Conference office. I coached college football at the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. I was the director of the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, Colorado, an assistant athletic director at Stanford. Um, worked here at Disney for Disney's Wild World of Sports, helped open the, the entire complex, and then became the director of the PGA Tour golf event, the Disney Golf Classic, and then got involved in the television on full time basis. So a, a different journey. AJ, when you were playing, you were probably someone that we could have identified as someday he'd be a good broadcaster just based on your personality <laughs> alone. I, I don't know about that. If you ask Charles, <laughs> who's been around me a little more, he'll probably say not. But no, uh, that was exactly what people <laughs> were saying. I took, yeah, kind of the more traditional path. Uh, I was a player, um, played for a long time, very fortunate. And Fox Charles and I have a lot of similarities with Fox and know a lot of the same people. Uh, I was brought on by Fox early in my career around 2001, 2002. 
a lot of you guys in school here won't know there was a show called Best Damn Sports Show, which was on Fox, the regional Fox, and it had Chris Rose, Tom Arnold, John Sally, um, and it was on every night on the regional, like what would be considered like Fox Sports Florida or Sunshine Network. And they had a show, and they would ask me whenever I was playing in L.A., will you come on the show for a day or two? And I started coming on that, and all the people now that were on that show have now ascended to Eric Shanks, who, who's the head of Fox Sports, John Entz, who was the head of Fox Sports. All these people moved from Best Dam all the way to the top of the ladder. And when I was playing, they started asking me, hey, will you do pre and post game for the postseason, And I was like, yeah, why not? I got nothing else to do. I'm not playing in the postseason." So uh, I think my first time was 2004. I did it uh, three weeks straight on best damn every day. They flew me in and out. Uh, then 2006, I did my first actual series uh, with Genie Zelasco. And I think uh, Eric Burns maybe did the pre and post. And then 2011, I was still playing. 2011, they came to me and said, hey, we want you to do start this again. So I did 11, 12, 13, uh, from all the way through to the World Series. Uh, 14, I was in the LCS with the Cardinals. I say a Cardinals jersey. Uh, they asked me to come do the World Series, and I have a wife and two kids, and my wife was like, uh, you're just gone for an extra three weeks. If you go for the last week, don't come home. So I was like, <laughs> I'm going to pass. Uh, 15, they asked me to do a series. I worked with Mad Veskersion and John Smoltz, did a calling uh, as the third guy. Uh, did that went well. Matt Vaskersian went on to do Sunday Night Baseball. Smoltz is the lead guy for Fox now. 16 was my last year playing. They came to me and said, hey, we want you to do it again, but we need to know you're not going to play next year. And I was like, I can't give you that promise. Until after the postseason, then I went back to him and said, hey, I'm not going to play. And they said, okay, we want you to start doing games. And so from 17 on, I've been with Fox. And unlike Charles, my first game, I will admit, was a disaster because – they, I didn't know anything. I didn't say mine wasn't. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know that. what I was doing. I didn't they don't say give that. You, me and I'll never forget Mar, uh, Kenny Albert, yep. who's a very famous announcer, and, and I in Tampa. It was Yankees at Tampa. Like they're like, go and I'm get. I'm sure they gave you a whole lot oh, of direction. Oh, they said go right? get them. That they was just it. They said, you know, camera don't, on, go. Right. Don't, don't curse on the air. <laughs> that was basically it. That's pretty much the roadmap. And we'll see how you do. And yeah. since then, I've been doing it now for, well, I guess this is my fifth year. Uh, and I'm fortunate enough I get to work great. All the big Fox games on Saturday, playoffs up until the LCS when they drop down to one crew, and uh, it really is its a dream come true to be able to stay in baseball and, and call games. I know you're going to move on real quickly, but for all of you out there, if you go back and Google AJ starting this, this journey broadcasting, while as a player, you'll notice that's pretty rare. Doesn't happen very often. While your career is going on, they ask you to come and do those. So there's a universal respect there. The position he played, understanding the game better than anyone else. And the reviews for him out of the gate were off the charts. He's being modest about them saying, well, are you going to play the next year? They were trying to get him to retire from the first time he went because they wanted to make him full time. And he still had a lot of baseball left to give. So, Indeed. AJ mentioned uh, John Enns who was on my staff when I was producing the 11 o'clock Sports Center, And he went on to run Fox, and I am here with you guys. Win for me. Win for me. Uh, Byron Saxton. Wait, hold on, before, hold on. Speaking of, I'm sorry. Yeah. Before, but, right. did, were you the one that talked? If you guys don't know, John Entz is one of the strangest texters of all time. Now, Charles will back me up. Ever. And so I don't know if you taught him how to do this, but he would randomly text you at like 2 in the morning and say, the grass is green. And you'd say, what are you talking about? And no response after For like that. three weeks. And then he'd be like, the sky is blue. And you're like, what? Is he talking? So I, you must that have didn't taught come him. for me, no. That, that was not you. No. Well, frankly, when John was working for me, I don't think we had texting yet. So it's, it's been a minute. Uh, Byron, at the time you were getting into wrestling, you had already done television in Gainesville. So you had a bit of a, maybe a bit of a tug of war in terms of what you wanted to do? Uh, yeah, it's funny. Um, I, you know, of course, graduated from UF, and uh, my, I got my first television job uh, in Jacksonville. And I ended up doing, I, I did uh, news reporting, I did sports, I did traffic. And I was still pursuing a wrestling career at the same time. So basically, um, you know, I'm working, I think my schedule at the time was like Sunday through, uh, uh, through Thursday. And then uh, Friday and Saturday was my weekend. Well, 
on Saturdays, I'd be going out doing small independent wrestling shows and getting beat up on the weekend or, or ring announcing. And I always try to downplay it for my news director so she wouldn't tell me, no, you can't do that anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I was able to obtain experience that way. And during that time, I had probably about three different tryouts uh, with WWE. And I remember going out, they had a reality show called Tough Enough at the time. Um, they flew me out to Venice Beach, California. And I'm like, yeah, this is my chance. I'm, you know, Because wrestling was always the thing I wanted to do as a kid. I'm like, this is my chance. I'm going to do this. Um, they had me out on the beach doing all these ungodly <laughs> workouts. It was horrible. At the time, on a, on a side note, too, I was wearing contacts, but I had an eye infection. So I was doing one contact per eye. So I was like half blind during my first tryout <laughs> as well. Um, but uh, I came back from that tryout didn't get hired so of course that destroyed my morale uh, but uh, in the grand scheme of things it actually worked out because three tryouts later not only did I finally get the offer and the opportunity to join WWE uh, but I also had extensive broadcast experience under my belt so when I sent in my my audition tape back in the day I know things have changed a little bit um, I had footage of me wrestling I had footage of me ring announcing and I had footage of me doing commentary so to WWE it made me more marketable and you know my just to give you the timeline here my first tryout actually first sent in a tape in college which was 2001 okay so between sending in that tape three tryouts I got hired in 2007 so there was a lot of effort and time put forth to finally get there. But it's one of those things where, like, when you're in the midst of it, you're going, like, I want this now. And then when your opportunity doesn't open up, you're, you know, you're, you go nuts. But then when you look back, you go, okay, I'm glad I traveled this road that I didn't expect. Because had I not traveled that road, I probably wouldn't have got hired because I probably wouldn't have been qualified. So, um, but that, that news experience uh, helped me a great deal. More terrifying, your first professional match or your first live shot in news? Oh, first match. Yeah. First match. Well, I mean, I'm out there half naked. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're standing there basically in what your underwear. What news story were you covering? <laughs> I mean, oh, wrestling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, doing TV news was always uh, a highly pressurized situation. In fact, one of the scariest moments in TV news, I recall, is when I had to actually do a live shot on the morning show from a shark tank. And of course, like, I don't want to say no, and I'm trying to put a brave face on, but I remember we're like 30 seconds out from the live shot. I'm just wild. I feel like I'm in the middle of Jaws, just all these sharks just circling me, and my heart's racing, and I'm trying. To, I never have never had like an anxiety attack, but that's as close as I came. I don't know how I pulled it off. Um, but yeah, with wrestling, there's just. Uh, there's so many unpredictable variables. Like you're out there, you're in front of a crowd, you don't know how they're going to react to you. Uh, you're also in there with, you know, your opponent. So you're worried about your physical well-being because uh, you're, you know, you're working together with the guy you're in there with. You put your health in their hands and vice versa. So you always want to make sure you know, everything goes right. So there's just, you know, a ton of nerves going through that. But, um, but at the same time, it's, you know, it's a dream. So if you're doing something that's a dream of yours that when you have those nerves, I think that's a healthy thing as well. Charles, you did college games before you did an NFL game. But what do you remember about that first NFL broadcast? Well, the first one was a part of getting ready for a college game, which was the crazy part. The, back then, Fox had the BCS, which later turned into the college football playoff. So in order to get us going with our new team, because we were a brand new team, Tom Brenneman, play-by-play, -play, Chris Meyer, sidelines, Barry Alvarez, the former coach at Wisconsin, and myself, they had us do an Arizona Cardinals home game. And so that was my first NFL game, but at the same time, I didn't really count it because we were they, they just kind of put us on it to try and give us some chemistry and work through us. So my first true NFL game when I was really part of the team doing NFL games was Philadelphia at Carolina. Donovan McNabb was a quarterback for Philadelphia. Jake DeLome from Carolina. And, J and Carolina was good. And it had a horrendous playoff game. Jake had had a horrible playoff game. And he had to bounce back from that. And the season opener, he was horrible again and really never quite got it back. One of the best guys you'll ever meet. But for whatever happened that, and that was my first game, and Donovan McNabb broke a couple of ribs that day as well, so the quarterbacks had a tough one. But what I remember most about it was just I was worried about how I'd be accepted in the NFL. You know, college guy, never played in the NFL, never coached in the NFL, wasn't an executive in the NFL, and I was terrified. I remember Andy Reid was the head coach of Philadelphia, and I was asking him questions. I just kind of said to him, I said, Coach, 
is it going to be a problem that I didn't play or whatever? He said, it'd be a problem if you don't know what you're talking about. And that was it. You know, kind of like, hey, if you got it, just just, just do, do what you can do. I've never forgot him saying that. AJ, your, your story isn't uncommon, unfortunately, in professional broadcasting. And we often take guys off the field and say, here's your microphone, answer the questions you're asked, and, and talk when it seems like a good time to talk. So take us inside your first broadcast and just what you were feeling and what you were experiencing that day. Well, first of all, Byron, I've been in the ring also, and uh, I agree with you. The most nervous I've ever been was the first time I got into the ring because I didn't want to screw up really bad. It's like when, stepping when, into when chaos. Oh, it was what completely different. Uh, TNA back in the day when they oh, were yeah. Universal, yeah. we did a whole thing, right? Yeah. And I won the X title, division title. <laughs> we have a were, former wrestling champion here. Yeah, <laughs> three times. I got three belts. Right here. Three of them. Yeah. Give that man a belt. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I was scared to death because there's so many things like baseball, World Series, All Star Game, any, you know, any baseball situation. But I, when I had to walk down the ramp and the <laughs> music hit and we came out and the whole thing, I mean, I was just please, God, don't let me screw this up because <laughs> like, I'm because you know I, we all kind of know about wrestling, right? And, and what it is. And, and I'll say this: like they, the outcome might be kind of predetermined. But I know how hard I've hit people with objects and how well they take it. It is not fake. So I will stand up for wrestlers to the day I die. It is not fake. It might be predetermined, some of it, but it is not fake. Now, to your question, I wasn't as nervous as I was when I wrestled, but we're in Tampa Bay, Yankees. So, of course, they give me the Yankees first. So course, everyone's right watching, right? The, the they whole country's watching. Yeah, they couldn't give me Tampa, Miami, where nobody, <laughs> nobody pays attention. I get Yankees, Tampa. Aaron Judge just gets up, right? So he was like kind of the star, and I remember I knew. Luckily, I, I had just gotten out of playing, so I knew all the players, I knew all the coaches, I knew the managers. Girardi was great. Uh, I went in, talked to the coaches about guys. You know, tell me about Aaron Judge, and they tell you about this, and you tell me about the Rays guys, and they were good. So, and, and then you get into it, and Kenny. I was like I said, Kenny Albert is great. He, he does. If you watch a hockey game, he's the voice of the NHL, and and, and does basketball and, and baseball and everything and football. And he's an absolute cyborg. Yeah, he's he's I unbelievable. Mean, there's nothing he doesn't know. It's he's unbelievable. unbelievable. So we get into the first game. He goes, look, I'll get you through it. Just I know you're a little bit nervous. So I'll just get you through it. And he was so great. He just kept asking me questions, right? And the only advice I ever got from anybody at Fox, and, and I'm sure Charles anyway, was they're like, just don't talk the whole time. Like, let the game play and let Kenny tell you when to talk. And I was so thankful that Kenny was there because he kind of led me through it. And you still feel like you talk too much because then, because you know, I'm sure you, you guys can tell, when you're sitting there and you're watching an event and there's silence, you think that you need to say something. But in reality, like the game is happening or the, the match is happening and you can just kind of let the crowd and the, the scene, because the camera guys, the producers are so great at what they do. And that's the hardest thing I think to learn because a lot of times when I watch new guys do it, they just can't stop talking. And it's hard to like, all right, I don't need, the guy hit a ground ball a second. I don't need to analyze it. Like play by play guy, is that a ground ball a second? And you're like, okay, yeah. great, move on. But that was, for me, it was, it was scary. I was glad it was over and then, but wrestling still got it. Well, that, that's a great point. We, our students do the broadcasting for Rollins College. And one of the things I try to impart on them is let the game breathe, especially baseball. Baseball, even now, as we, if you, once they start playing again, we don't watch a baseball game with our undivided attention. It's background noise. We're on our computers or iPads, whatever, and then every once in a while I need to look up. So I will tell them, watch some broadcasts and see how long you can count before somebody talks. And a lot of games tell you, you can't get past three seconds, and it's not necessary. To your point, the cameraman, the director, they're bringing you into the environment. That's, that's half the battle. Byron, outside of hoping you weren't going to get assaulted by Brock Lesnar, <laughs> what do you recall about your first Monday Night Raw? Ooh. Uh, well, good thing I was wearing dark pants that day. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, it's, it's funny how it, how it happened because... Uh, you know, I had been on the road with WWE, and I'd been doing some of their secondary shows. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Monday Night Raw is like their their flagship program. You know, it's three hours long. That's where, you know, your main storylines take place. You know, the other show now is Friday Night SmackDown. They're basically on equal level now. But Raw, like, for years, that was the show. 
And uh, so I remember getting a call earlier that day uh, being told, hey, uh, something funky might be going down tonight. You're probably going to be calling the show. And in the WWE world, uh, things are just ever changing. Uh, you know, we may have a show lineup set at like noon and then at six o'clock, we've had about five different drafts. So <laughs> you're always on your toes, you know, because things are just and that's part of the creative process and, you know, entertainment, you know, kind of you may feel like you want a character to go one way and then you realize, OK, maybe we need to go this way. So that changes. And of course, that adjusts the whole broadcast. Um, but I was, I was told, all right, there's a there's a good probability you're going to be doing the show tonight. Uh then I was told, uh, okay, you're probably going to do the show um, with uh, Jerry the King Lawler, who is a long-time, long-time wrestler, long-time commentator uh, for WWE as well. So I'm like, okay, cool. I've never, I've never been in the play-by-play -play spot, which was what they were going to have me do that night. Um, I'd never done that on WWE television, but I knew I had King with me. So uh, you know, I figured, yeah, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll get through it. Well, then... As things always change, the show starts at eight o'clock. Okay, so you you think things are set there? Not quite. Uh, about eight fifteen, I'm looking at the show lineup, and I'm seeing like seg eight. Oh, Byron Saxton goes to the ring, and I'm looking at the lineup, and I'm going, wait, that that's where's King's name? Because I was told King is coming with me, and so I'm like flipping through, and I'm going. Seg nine, no king. Seg ten. So there, basically, there was a couple segments where I was going to be out there alone, <laughs> and I knew this like thirty minutes beforehand. So hence the dark pants. Uh, <laughs> so and uh, and and just to paint the picture for you, they did a scene where Brock Lesnar, um, who's big star in WWE, UFC, he destroys the entire commentary team, uh, destroys the <laughs> announce desk. So I remember running out there. And, uh, and it's, it's the, the, the night after WrestleMania, which is our biggest event of the year. It's our Super Bowl. Um, so we've got, I mean, packed house, fans from all over the world. And so I'm going to call the show alone. And that reality alone is like, <laughs> hold on, the biggest Raw of the year, and you got me out there? And then on top of that, they, the desk had been overturned. So I essentially, <laughs> I got to just <laughs> have you visualize it. The desk is overturned, so our monitors are typically lodged in the desk to call the show. Well, since the desk is overturned, there's no monitor, so our local PA there on the floor is holding up a monitor. He has one on the side for me. I have to sit, <coughs> crisscross applesauce, basically, <laughs> staring at a monitor. So I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> in this position... <laughs> the biggest show of the year and this is how I'm calling the show so needless to say uh I was I was racked with nerves and of course uh you know it was it was an experience that uh didn't go too well um I found out how aggressive Twitter can be that night <laughs> uh, uh, to the point that even my mom who knows nothing about the internet she comes in she goes I heard you have a lot of heat with the company <laughs> um so that's yeah I, I'm glad I went through it um, cause it, it was a learning experience and that's what, you know, everything we do is yeah. whether, whether we fail or succeed, but I will never forget it. Yeah. It's all about those reps yeah. and you do it once, you know what it's going to feel like and you don't want to feel like that again. No. <laughs> uh, Ch Charles and AJ, you guys have the luxury of the game knowledge and knowing what it's like to be on the field, to call pitches, to call plays, whatever. But at some point as a broadcaster preparation comes into play. You can't just fall back on, I know this stuff. So Charles, walk us through a little bit how you prepare for an NFL game. Yeah, that's a great point, Gus. And, and for me, and people always ask, how long do, do you get this question? And I'm sure you get the same <laughs> Every question. Every single person. How long does it take for you to prepare for a game or an event, oh, yeah. right? And my answer is always the same as long as it takes to get the job done. Meaning every person's going to prepare differently, have different timelines, all that. If you're just sitting there saying, I've got one hour, I'm gonna do it, it, it just doesn't work. You have to find out what works for you, for your comfort level, for you to know that you know the information backwards and forwards, to have everything down for that event. So for me, I typically will call a game on Sunday and I have information with me that I start preparing for my next game, because typically you know your next game at that point on the flight home. That's how I do it. Now, other people, they take some time, they get some rest, they do whatever, however they want to do it. Never judge whoever you're working with by their preparation unless it comes out on air that they aren't prepared. 
because every person has their own process. And I'll start then, and it's just Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, typically leave on Thursday, and my preparation is reading information, watching game tape, talking to different people, understanding the league, just making sure you see the shows, all the things, the transactions, all that that goes into the hopper, and having a decent idea of how I think this game is going to go. But as Byron just talked about, you may have an idea of how it's going to go. AJ knows who's pitching that day and knows how they want to pitch. But sometimes those things adjust, change on you in a hurry. He doesn't have his best stuff. They change when <laughs> Byron's going to the ring by himself now. No King Lawler. What, what, when did that happen? I think that they're going to throw the ball a lot. They come out and run it 15 times in a row. What's your adjustment process? At the end of all of your preparation, isn't it pretty much what's in front of us? Just react. Call what's there. <laughs> That's kind of how we have to get to it. AJ, how did your process evolve? Well, I'm glad Charles spends all week because I am the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> when I first got out, I knew everybody, so it was easy. I could just uh, face this guy 50 times. I know what he's going to throw. I face his team. I know as I've been out now, I have to do a little more preparation. But I think in baseball, it's different because it's a daily game. So football, one game a week. So he sees Sunday. He knows who he has. Well, I have a week. So if I do a game on Saturday, okay, say I do Cubs Cardinals Saturday and I have Yankees Red Sox the next Saturday, I'll typically, we'll typically guess on who's going to pitch. We don't, don't normally find out. So I try to watch the pitcher who we think is going to pitch because with the MLB package, you can kind of watch every game now. So I'll, I'll guess and say, okay, uh, you know, Garrett Cole is pitching against, uh, Chris Sale on Saturday, we think. Now, there could be a rain out. There could be, a, who knows, they, they could, you know, get a toenail, uh, you know, whatever it is, they might miss the start. So you have to be, that's kind of my preparation. And then I'll watch, I try to watch the game, definitely if the game's on Saturday, we always, I always watch the game Friday night. I try to watch the home broadcast of the starter the time before because he'll they'll give you a lot of the information how he's throwing what's he trying to do uh we get clips media clips all week sent to us for the two teams read through those you get some tidbits here and there it's very generic usually uh friday we have a meeting with the starting pitcher uh whoever it is we get 10 minutes with them in the it used to be in the locker room but now it's on zoom uh then saturday we go into the stadium if we're traveling uh, and we sit down with the managers for about 15 minutes of both teams, and you try to get everything you can in those 15 minutes. It's, but at the end of the day, I'm not a big stat broadcaster guy. I'm not, you know, I understand the saber metrics and I understand the, all the numbers, but I don't think if you're listening at home, you understand what's happening, and I'd rather tell you what I'm seeing. So I, I'll take. I get a. I have a guy, Joe Davis, who you worked with. He has a guy named Rick, who's a stat guy. Every game, before every game, he sends me a, a stat basically a rundown of nuggets on every guy on both teams. And so the day of the game, the morning of the game, if it's a 7 o'clock game, usually about lunch, I'll sit down and I'll go through them and I'll just take like one or two things off each guy and write it in my little scorebook and do -do 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 through every guy, right, for the starting nine. Now, and that's it, and that's all I'll have, and then the rest I'll just let the game tell me. Because if you're watching the game, we put their batting average in their home run, so you know who's having a good year, who's hot, who's not. The guys do all that. So for baseball, it's a little bit different. Um, you know, for me, it's more, and then there's all these great websites. There's Baseball Savant, there's Brooks Baseball, there's Inside Edge, and I can find any stat I want to find. And so, like, we'll bring in a relief pitcher, and I'm not sure I know him. I can go, while they're bringing him in, I can type in on Baseball Savant and say, show me, I don't know, uh, or roll this Chapman. And it'll show me five clips in 10 seconds. And he'll show me every pitch he's thrown, what count he throws him in, the percentage he throws him, how hard he throws him. So it's, it's changed because of the, the information that's out there. So, so for me, it's more of watch the game, go feel how the game, and trying to guess what's going to happen. Because in a baseball game, if uh, you, you talk to the manager and you watch the team, you can say, okay, the Yankees have a lead in the sixth inning. They're going to go to Britain. They're going to go to Chapman in the ninth, Britain in the eighth, who, you know, back it up. And you say, okay, if, if Garrett Cole gives him six innings and this, this, this. And you ask the manager before the game, hey, is everyone available? Yes, okay, you do this. Yes, and then they follow the script. But then when the game gets wild and it gets hard, is it's 15 to nothing in the second inning, and you've got three and a half hours to fill, and there's no stat in the world that'll do it. It is just BS your way through it. <laughs> tell stories, 
look for something funny in the crowd you can get an inning out of. There's a guy with a nacho helmet eating ice cream or doing something silly, get an inning out of that. So it, it's a little different because we don't have the we don't have the week to get ready. It is that day and it can change like that. And that's when you find out if you kind of have it. You know, when things change, when the game gets out of hand. The easiest games to broadcast, I would guess, the easiest events to broadcast, when they go according to script, right? When they go according to how you expect it to be. It's a good tight game. A lousy game is when you find out if you're a good broadcaster. A bad game, a blowout, all those, because you've got to find those things that AJ was talking about. And we're really not as different because we have those meetings with coaches. We have those meetings with quarterbacks. We have those go to practice and see things. I write those little nuggets on my boards just like AJ talked about. There's a lot of similarities across it. It's just how you utilize it, how you, how you utilize it, and then how you transmit it. Byron, your world is different um, in part because you have no offseason and you're constantly basically with the same team. But you still have six, eight, ten matches that you have to prepare for, not two teams playing each other. So what's your process? Uh, so my process has changed uh, over the years, and a lot of that is just because of all the content we put out. So, you know, we do a show, and we've got an incredible social media team. So you got guys doing interviews on social media. you got guys putting out stuff on their own social media. So for me, it's kind of uh, covering all those bases. You know, uh, when I first started, it was, okay, this happened on Monday Night Raw or this happened on SmackDown. Make sure I'm up to date on all the different stories here so I can bring that forward if I need to. Now it's, okay, what is this person tweeting throughout the week? What are they posting on Instagram? What can I use to potentially uh, bring that story forward? Um, I'm an over-preparer by nature because I'd rather like do everything I can to make sure I won't get caught off guard even though you know, I'm the opposite by the way yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry I admire that <laughs> ability <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah it's really just kind of you know dotting every I crossing every T that you can and then um, w with us too you know you talked about the guy with the nacho hat and all this stuff like we have such limited real estate because our average match is say six to eight minutes long so you're either pumping up, uh, you're putting in a plug for a sponsor, you're pumping up the next show. There's certain storyline points you know you have to get through. So speaking in sound bites is so imperative for us, but still trying to tell a story uh, within that context. So it's, you know, I may have a page full of notes and I might get one or two of those. And then, um, you know, Charles' point, a lot of it's just reactionary too, because you, know, you might have certain story points you want to uh, put forth, but if the match isn't, flowing in a way that allows you to do that again you have to switch gears immediately uh, so long story short i over prepare but at the end of the day it comes down to what happens in that moment and how much base knowledge you have to tell a story that needs to be told hey, real quick gus before you go with yours and with you know wwe i'm old enough aj and i are probably old enough to remember the wwwf yeah and how much broadcasts have changed over that time because yeah. for you guys out there they used to have matches with a 60 minute time limit <laughs> literally and they would go an hour like these matches would literally go an hour and the setup and the finish were way different because you're talking about six to eight minutes yeah you remember how long it would take we'd hold a guy with a sleeper hold or just you know yeah. or they put a figure and they'd hold him for a while and it'd be there for five minutes <laughs> yeah. that's a whole different I mean, broadcast and, and, you have now. and to that point too it's changed so much because back in the day you know um our commentators were very similar to, to sports commentators where you just you called that body slam you called that clothesline and now the way our product has shifted and adjusted over the years it really is more about storytelling yeah. you know we get told all the time you're not you're not calling radio here like i don't need you the viewer can see what's happening i don't need you to tell me every single thing that competitor is doing but what i do need you to do is tell me their motivation tell me their background because what our what our product does is sell emotion so if we can't create an emotional connection between the competitor for the fan to understand they have no reason to cheer the competitor or boo the competitor or be emotionally invested and therefore we've just wasted a segment did they cheer, I, I, did they cheer I, I, you with tna were you were you a I heel was, or, I was or were you both. a baby face it was way more fun being a heel oh, i went both 
I did Love both. It. Face was boring. You did he did he tell you, so you didn't know that oh, he was on Raw too. Yeah. When, raw he almost, Price he almost, was Raw with he Bob, Barker. Bob Barker. Yeah. <laughs> I was nervous. <laughs> By the way, when I did that, I was scared to death because they were told me they said you have to say this exact thing. If you don't say this. It's not going to show up right, and then you're going to get body slammed by Big Show. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't want that. Did, 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 you, punch, did you punch Bob Barker like Happy, like yeah. happy Gilmore? Price is wrong, Bob. Did you, did, you, did you do it? Did you like Happy Gilmore and take yes. on Bob? Uh, but I, I actually do have a – because I'm obviously a wrestling person, fan, Mark, whatever you want to call me. Um, how much – you we're can all, say we're all no. Fans, so we're how, how much do they tell you, though, when you call it? Do they – do you, you know – you know the time and you know the finish. Do they tell you that or is so, that all? I typically don't know the finish. Okay. You know, in a rare case, I do, and I, I kind of prefer it that way because yeah. I do want to be able to have that that natural visceral yeah. reaction yeah. to what's going on. Um, and and again, there's there's times where even if you assume one person is you know going to win the match, that could change. You know, because they decided last second, hey, we're going to adjust the storyline. Or there's times where in the middle of a match, like someone legitimately gets hurt. So, so again, I mean, you've got to just flow with it. Like, we had a situation a couple weeks ago on the show where uh, one tag team was supposed to win the match. Um, it didn't go that way uh, because our, our, like our referees, it's up to the wrestler to kick out. And if you don't kick out, boom, boom, boom. So <laughs> we can't go, oh, hold on, everybody. That wasn't the way it was supposed to end. We'll get back. No, you got to just react and go. Yeah. So uh, it's well, this year at the Royal Rumble, I, I'm guessing Kofi Kingston's feet weren't supposed to yes, hit the that's ground. Another, yeah. So we're, we're doing, I mean, all these guys, a lot of these guys are doing such high-end stunts that, you know, Law of Averages says things aren't always going to go right. And again, like how the guys react in there, it's the same for the, for the guys in the ring. It's the same thing. You know, um, you may have something planned. Maybe the crowd isn't where you want them to be, so therefore you have to adjust what you're doing. Or maybe somebody gets a little banged up. Maybe they get the wind knocked out of them. You have to be able to adjust without exposing what's going on to the audience. But the competition, right, JJ mentioned it before. It may be a predetermined outcome for the most part. But everyone goes into it with the idea they're competing. I had a college teammate, many of you may or may not. His name was Doug Furness, and he was known as the strongest man in the world at the time. Big, big guy, yeah, squat a yeah, thousand yeah. pounds in the whole deal, yeah. right? So Doug made it to the I WWE remember. and the whole deal, and the whole thing. Well, when he was working the regional circuits, Knoxville, Tennessee, had another teammate named, named, named Lee North who played with Doug. And Lee told me one day, he said, did you see Doug today? And I said, no, I haven't seen him today. He goes, get him a belt. He's a, he's a champ. <laughs> and I said, that is so cool. He said, be careful, though, when you talk to him. I said, what are you talking about? Man, I made the biggest mistake. He said, we went out, and I was going to go with him to a match. And I hopped in the car, and Doug's driving. I said, well, Doug, we're going to win or lose tonight. And Doug looked at me and said, if that's the way you feel, but you can just get the hell out of my car. <laughs> and he said, let's go get him, champ. I never said another word. So the point being, we may talk about it that way, but the people involved, the competition, wanting to get it right, health is into your hands and his health is in, right? Yeah. The health back and forth, mm -hmm. making sure you get it right. There's a lot that goes into it. So there's got to be a bit major respect factor. One thing I want to touch on today, because many of the students here want to be a studio host or want to do play-by-play. -play. You all have had experience working with hosts and play-by-play -play guys. So Charles, starting with you, what do you think is one of the keys from the host perspective in terms of a good working relationship and a good on-air product? I think we're working with a host, number one, the host listening to what you are saying and advancing things and illuminating things that way, that, that nature. And you, of course, listen to what the host asks you. So don't and give an answer that just didn't come, that came out of nowhere. It, 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 AJ talked about Kenny Albert, who can do everything. And he is so good with any partner that he works with because he will go over things with you ahead of time to find where the comfort level is, to try and get you to a certain place, to try and get the story that, that we want to get in advance the right way. Those are the things I think are really important. I've served in those roles, and they're not easy to be light on your feet, so to speak, and be able to adjust to what comes at you. <laughs> when, when, when you ask a question, all of a sudden this major curveball, you'll be able to advance, be able to handle, be able to do those things. Those are a big part of it for me. AJ? I, I agree. Um, I've never done play-by-play -play or I've never hosted a show. I've I always, did, and I hope no one ever I, finds I, I was always the I'm always the secondary guy, right? So I always follow, and for me, the, I always follow what the host or the play-by-play -play guy says. And again, we talk about it and say, all right, we want to get to this 
at some point in the game, we want to get to this if the game takes us there. And then he'll, he'll the good play-by-play -play guy, the good host will weave where you're at. They'll listen to what you say, and then they'll continue it, moving it down the line. And then also stop it, right? You don't need to talk about so-and-so for three innings. Like, okay, we talked about it for a minute. All right, well, it's done. Let's move back to the game. And I think most play-by-play -play guys that are good. And I, listen, Charles has worked with a lot of guys. I've Pretty much everybody on Fox Baseball I've had an opportunity to call a game with, from Joe Buck to Kenny Albert to Adam Amin, who you know well. Uh, I mean, these guys are, are the best of the best. And um, a game can be a little more difficult than even a studio show, though. I mean, I've did... Fox used to have a show called Whip Around out in the studio, and I'd go out and do it for a week, and Chris Myers and, and uh, Kevin Burkhardt and, and all these guys would do the show, and we'd, we'd go through the show before. Way more scripted. Yeah, we'd go through the show before, and I would never watch the highlights, and I would never – I, whoever my partner was, it was three-person – They'd be sitting there, and, they'd, and they're like, why aren't you watching that? And I'm like, I don't want to know. I just want to react to yeah. the highlight. I don't want, kind of like what Byron says, you don't want to know the finish, right? Yeah. I don't want to know. I, I already know the score and who won the game, but I don't want to see what we're going to show because I'd rather have a more natural reaction. And a good host goes off what you say. If I say, oh, that was incredible. Oh, well, let's show it again, or let's break that down, and they, and they jump on it on the fly. So it's, it's, it's about being able to adjust. It's being able to work with whoever you're with, and it's being able to put – not only yourself, but your partner in a good situation. I had a lot of Baseball Tonight or Sports Center meetings where the analysts would start to get into a conversation and I would stop them and say, save it for the air. Yeah. I, I don't want you to, I want your reactions to be honest and not know that he's going to say that, so I'm going to come back and say this. Now, when you're doing it, you have to listen to your broadcast team, but you also have to listen to Vincent Kennedy McMahon, who is in your ear for a lot of the show. So what's, what's that like? And then after this, we're going to open it up for your guys' questions. Well, the voice of Vincent Kennedy McMahon uh, tends to trump everybody else. <laughs> uh, so he says something, uh, you say it. And there's been situations, funny enough, uh, <laughs> where because I'm, I'm typically working with two other guys in my, in my broadcast booth, and... Uh, you know, there's times where perhaps what I'm being told might not be in line with, with what they might be communicating to me or, or even asking me. I've been in that situation because they may not hear what I'm hearing. So they're asking me a question and I'm getting told to say something else. <laughs> so I'm like totally ignoring their, <laughs> their question. Well, what's in here is way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, which totally kind of defies the logic of what we were talking right. about listening to your broadcast partner. But when that isn't uh, the case, uh, it's, it's the same. I know. When I, because I've had the pleasure of doing play-by-play, -play, I've done the hosting and as well as you know the, the color analyst work, and uh, I know one of the issues I struggled with early on was being on my own island, as I used to say, you know, because I I would prepare so much, and not always pay attention to what my partner was saying. Um, so, to the point that you guys brought up, it, it's so imperative not only through repetitions you learn the style of your partner, and you know, you understand perhaps as a host, like you trust the host to maybe give you questions that they know you're qualified to answer based on your background. Um, you know, I, I've been in the ring, so, you know, my partner could say, hey, Byron, you've had this experience. What is this like? Um, and then, of course, understanding that you got to speak in those sound bites. Deliver, you know, whatever points you have to make. And then, and then again, trusting your partner. It's all about trust. Okay, you tr I trust that my host or my play-by-play -play guy is going to lead me where he needs me to go, and then he trusts me that I'm going to stick to that conversation so we can keep the flow going. They also don't have partners telling them to shut the hell up, which that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. happens to you every that Monday happens night. happens on occasion <laughs> as well. Right? You produce? Do you produce? Do you produce? I did, yeah. yeah. You've had a producer. I've had a producer in my ear tell me to shut that oh, up. Oh, God, many times. <laughs> Stop, but, cut. But, no, I'm Stop talking, before you get in I'm, trouble. I'm talking to co-host on the air. Co-host. Oh, yeah. co yeah. I, I, yeah, I told a lot of talent oh, to shut geez. up. I've, I've had both. <laughs> I, I, I've been cursed out in this ear and then yelled at by partners. So it's, yeah, <laughs> and, you know, again, showing age, right? We remember Vince McMahon as the play-by-play. Oh, he, play. yeah. he was the play-by-play yeah. play voice yeah. of yep. the WWF, yeah. uh -huh. then the WWF, then the WWE, and the whole thing. So you're getting, you're getting it from a person who did all the things, not only and besides runs. It's like at times I get to be Vince reincarnated. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> he's going to tell you what to <laughs> You say. laugh a little Without like the him. paycheck, though. I'm you got that laugh there. Byron, <laughs> Byron, Byron, without the paycheck, though? Well, and, oh, yeah. It's not uh, about the money. Stock <laughs> options. <laughs> all right, let's get some questions from these guys. Throw your hand up, and they'll bring you a microphone. And we'll get to some questions from you guys. I love it. It's like Phil Donahue. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows. No one knows who Phil Donahue is. You remember that old Phil Donahue skit on Saturday Night Live, yes. where, where, where the guy—I forgot who it was—who played. He'd run down the aisle. <laughs> over. Hi, All right, my name's Dwayne Byron. This question is for you. So obviously, you know, a lot of people have the feeling that working for WWE is extremely chaotic. I want to know specifically most chaotic night to you working as a commentator for WWE. What what was that? What was that like? Oh man, um, I, 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 this probably won't directly answer it, but there's just there's so many chaotic nights just because things constantly change. Um, there's many nights. So Monday Night Raw is a 16 segment show. Okay, it runs from 8 p.m. to 11 o'clock. I can't tell you how many times we start the show and our producer goes, "Okay, we have seg one." <laughs> we'll go from there. And, and, and legit, this happens, I mean, no lie, every couple months. Like, it's, it's that prevalent. And so, because matches are changing or whatnot, but hey, we're on the air, okay? We have, you know, the first 15 minutes covered, and then the writers or whoever backstage is scrambling to kind of keep us updated. We have a great director, great producer, so luckily, like, they keep us honest, you know. Um, this happens almost weekly, where we're in the middle of a segment, and during commercial break, uh, you know, our producer comes on and says, okay, uh, I know we have this scheduled during seg two, but instead we're going to start off with this, we're going to have it on camera, then we're going to go to a backstage segment, and then we're going to come to you. And uh, so I think for me, I've just gotten so used to that. You know, I think the day that I walk in and see a show line up at like noon, and that is what we have at eight, like that'll shock me because <laughs> I'm just not used to that consistency. So uh, I know it doesn't completely answer your question, but. Were you on Raw the night it got snowed out? Yes, yes, we actually, so we had uh, the first and only night that Raw technically got canceled. Uh, we were supposed to be in Hartford, Connecticut. and we I couldn't... had bought tickets to the show for my kids for Christmas. Night. I'm sorry, okay, I feel bad now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why you brought it up. Uh, but no, for the first time, like the arena said, no, we can't do the show there because the weather's so bad. So Vince McMahon, being the ultimate adjuster <laughs> to, to, to situations, said, all right, uh, we're going to put on a three-hour show from our headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. So I had to drive literally through blizzard conditions um, to Stanford, and we just we pieced together a show. We played an old match. Uh, at one point, we did a segment on the top of the roof. In the snow. In the snow <laughs> of headquarters. Uh, we did a couple live interviews. I mean, that was, so you know what? Now that I think of it, that was probably there the most chaotic. <laughs> there it is. There's I got answer. the answer. <laughs> that might've been the most chaotic night just because. Um, and one of the highest rated. Uh, yeah, because literally we didn't have all of our wrestlers there. Yeah. You know, there was only a handful of us. We had a couple of announcers. We had, I mean, a handful of guys. And I remember at one point we're all just sitting in the room and we're going, all right. Uh, in a couple hours, we're going to put together a three-hour show. And so that was like as grassroots as grassroots gets. And there was a great curiosity factor, I think, which drove the ratings. People were wondering, how are they going to do this? Tonight? I was wondering so. how we were going to do it. <laughs> but, but we pulled it off. So, yes, got your answer. Thank you, Dwayne. Question over here. Uh, hi, I'm Sean. Um, my question's for Charles and AJ. Uh, you used to coach, and you played a lot. Have you ever thought of going from analyst to coach because I see that going on a, a lot lately. <laughs> no. Hard no, right? Uh, well, I, you see, you guys know, how many of you guys know Gordy back there? See how, Gordy! Many gray, see how many gray hairs Gordy has? Those are all for my son when Gordy used to coach my son, all the gray hairs. Uh, so I, for me personally, listen, if a team came to me and said, hey, we want you to be manage the Cardinals, like you can't say no to that really. Uh, am I actively out pursuing a manager's job? No. Uh, I like having all my hair, and <laughs> some of it's a little gray, but it would be a lot worse. And to be honest with you, I enjoy what I do now, and the grind of coaching is, is really hard. In baseball, it's every day, right? So the coaches get there at 11 o'clock in the morning, and they don't leave till midnight. And they turn around and do it the next day. And if something goes wrong, they get blamed no matter what. The player could have a bad day. The coaches get blamed. And for any Yankee fans, you guys see Aaron Boone, how old he's gotten quick, right? Like, I mean, he had heart problems 
you know, th before he took the job, he was like the youngest looking 45 year old guy in the world. And, you know, Alex Cora, like, I mean, lost all his hair and, you know, it's like, geez, guys, what happened to y'all? These are guys I played with, you know, and what happened to you guys? And they're like, this job's hard. And they're like, don't, you know, they were all announcers and now they're, bro and they're broadcasters. Now they're managers. And I'm like, all right, I'm, I think I'm just going to stay over here with Charles and Byron and, and just watch this show. It is. It's a whole different world. And it's like, if you ever watch presidents of the United States, when they take office and then when they leave office and then see them six months later, and it's like a new lease on life, like, whoo, all this is off of me. I, coaching was not something I wanted to get back to. General manager, front office, yeah. intriguing. All right, as, as AJ as AJ said, yeah, if someone, the paycheck's better too. I want to, yeah, sign me up. Anyone's, uh, yeah, I'll take GM too. It, Maybe owner. Yeah, there you go. But as AJ said, if they come to you with something like that, it's hard to turn it down because the one thing you miss as a broadcaster is the competition. It's the beauty of being a broadcaster. Game's over, we're on the plane or in the car, no big deal, right? But you also don't leave without that because you remember the highs. You remember when it was good. Remember when you competed and you won. And that feeling is maybe what you chase again as a coach, as a GM, as a whatever. Brian Greasy, who's just left Monday Night Football, is going to go back and coach for the San Francisco 49ers. I can't wait to see him about week 12 <laughs> and see how Brian's doing. Like, hey, man, you miss getting ready for Monday Night Football? Or how you doing? How's your quarterback playing? Because that, that's how everything changes for you. I think we got a question up here. Hi, guys. I'm KJ Doyle. Uh, Gus, I liked your last question. I was going to ask it, but that's all right. Uh, great minds think. Way to go, like Gus. Say. Um, Gus mentioned a lot of the great things we're able to do while we're in school, like calling games for Rollins and taking advantage of the studio. But I was wondering, once we're post-graduation, what are some of the things that you guys would advise us to do if we have aspirations of getting to those highest levels of sports broadcasting? I can't answer that because I didn't go to school. I didn't go to college. I Harvard of the South, Dr. Phillips High School. <laughs> I went to Cypress Creek. We were, oh, we were rivals. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> we used to beat you guys' brains in. <laughs> and oh, I'm right in the middle of this. I, can't, I mean, I, I didn't go to school. I, like I, you guys heard my story. Like, I was just kind of thrown into it. I think Charles would be the guy. I and mean, even Byron, they, you know, I, I've heard stories of guys, you know, guys I've done games with that started in, like, you know, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, doing weather, you know, and then they've worked their way up to. Where did you start in professional baseball? What level? I mean, the lowest rookie so, ball, Gold so you, Coast League. So you hit the buses, right? Yep. And you rode the buses from that all the way up, A, double A, triple A, major leagues. So you know what that's like. It's to say, it's a very similar thing. I don't want to steal anything Byron's going to say, but relationships, what you're starting to do right now as you meet people that come through. But the biggest thing is I think Byron gave us one of the best lessons. You're not going to necessarily get the job right out of the gate. You may have to interview for the same job multiple times. When was your tape? 2001? When did you get the job? 2007? Yep. You didn't just do nothing in between 2001 and 2007. You keep working on your craft. No job's too small. You go out and you get, what does I use the term, reps? When I came up through the ranks, I literally did Pop Warner football, Little League baseball, AAU basketball, boys and girls, Baseball, you're not going to believe this, AJ. I was the color analyst for the SEC Game of the Week on Fox Sports South for an entire season. <laughs> Do we, As we get some tapes of that? Yeah, Do it, you they're know out, what a they're, baseball they're out is? there and it's scary, right? <laughs> Baseball, as, as an analyst for that, I've done sidelines for the NCAA tournament for CBS. I've done sidelines for high school football for the FHSAA. I could go on forever and, and really mess you up. I actually did volleyball for UCF, okay? Bottom line is get your reps, learn your stuff, do your things, and make your mistakes along the way as you prepare yourself to go. Because one of the beauty, beauties of being a great player is you typically start at a great level. But it also, it comes at you really hard. Now Twitter is aggressive. Try being a former all-pro, all-star, and right out of the gate, you're calling the biggest games. And if you don't hit them right away, they come for you. I made my mistakes, single A, double A, triple A. They didn't come for me the same way. So when it came time, I had a chance. But develop your relationships, work on your craft, put yourself out there, give yourself a chance to fail, I always call it the Walendas. Anybody know who the Flying Walendas are? Anybody ever heard of the Flying Walendas? Yeah. Tightrope walkers, right? What was their hook? 
What was their hook? No nets. Everyone else worked with the net. The Volenda family, no nets. That was always the hook. A lot of what we do are no nets. Twitter Can't give yourself the chance. Twitter Honestly, shows scary and chase Jason Witten back to the game. Listen, J <laughs> J Jason is back coaching <laughs> high school football. But if Jason had started on the third or fourth team and worked his way up, had a chance to make a few mistakes, Jason would have had a chance. But Jason was working Monday Night Football. It's the biggest show on in town. You're the only game on. So every Tuesday was brutal because we all came for him on Tuesday. I still say, hey, if Jason had a chance to work his way through some things, might be a different story. But when oh. you work that high, you've got to hit it right out of the gate. And by the way, Tony Romo's kind of messed it up for everybody. <laughs> no, he's not. You because, guys are all getting paid Because you, you don't, well, they get paid. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't, get it, you don't get that same opportunity because Tony hit it so well, I think a lot of executives think the next person they hire it's going to hit it just like that. And it's, that's a rare thing that happens. Well, I don't have Twitter for that reason. Well, I got off two years ago, yeah, and I, I haven't mean, missed I, it. I, I would say, and Charles, I would also say this. You have to be able to take criticism. And, and I was told, I don't, I don't know how many of you guys know who Hawk Harrelson is. The Hawk. The, the longtime White's the Hall of Fame. He's in the Hall of Fame for broadcasting in Cooperstown. He, he told me when I first started doing this, he said, listen, not everyone's going to like you. Not everyone's going to dislike you. Just be yourself and know that you're doing the job the best you can, and that's it. And he's like, don't read what they write. People are going to write good things. People are going to write bad things. But be able to take some of the bad things and, and don't take it personally because Twitter, everyone knows, Twitter is like the worst thing ever invented for for people on television, people in their lives. You I mean, guys are it, smart for getting off it. Uh, I never had <laughs> it. So. You probably, you probably <laughs> but, can but, with your but, job. But be able to also understand, like, people are going to come after you, and, uh, and they've come after me, they've come after Charles, and, yeah. and, and just – be able to there are some things that are said that are like okay yeah i could maybe listen to that a little bit yeah that's i'm glad right? you brought but that up but at the same know in your heart what you're doing and, and you know like if you re like one of the best advice i was like one of the, the first couple games i did they're like rewatch them watch what you did and then think about the announcers i like watching and and, and think about what they have done that and then you start figuring out okay well there are things i can improve on and then you look at some of the comments you're like okay well, Maybe these people know a little bit, right? So we be, have to be able to take some criticism because it's going to come no matter how gr – I mean, Tony Romo, he gets killed. Troy Eggman, he's getting he, – everyone. Matter. Joe Buck, probably the best announcer in the world, he gets killed every day, right? I mean, people hate Joe Buck. I mean, but, but – but. Luck, luck, care. Luckily, now I can look at his paycheck and say they can hate me all they want. <laughs> simple, uh, simple piece of advice. Uh, I learned in the wrestling business, but you can apply it to any realm of work that you're in, especially when you're – working up to that level. Keep your mouth shut, keep your ears open, okay? Listen. AJ brought up the point, there's always someone that knows more than you do, or something, someone you can learn from. They may not even be doing exactly what you wanna do, but you can always get these little grains of knowledge from people that you come across along the way. Even though maybe your goal right there is that exit sign, and you may have to divert down to that back row and do something there. You may have to, you know, head to the back of the room and do something there, but eventually, you know, you keep that goal in mind, you build your resume, you build your experience, and you're more, more well-rounded because of it once you actually get to that final destination. I, I think one of the cool things about today is we have three guys working in three different arenas, but <laughs> delivering the same message. That's how universal this business is. That's why the stuff that we teach you is so repetitive in all your classes, because it's gonna come up over and over and over again, no matter whether you're doing wrestling or football or baseball. Let's give it up for AJ, Charles, and Byron. For the That's a wrap. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys.